follow me. I'm following. Eddie, welcome to the front row. Oh my God, what a, this is a hardcore setup. We're not like, messing around. No, you're certainly not. I feel like I'm on Oprah. <laughs> the orange chair is for you. Wow, that's Let's take good. A seat. Eddie, your performance in The Theory of Everything as Stephen Hawking has people comparing it to Daniel Day-Lewis in My Left Foot, which must blow your mind. But I want to know, how did you know in your heart that you could take this part on? I, I basically read this script and thought I knew a bit about Stephen Hawking and promptly realized that I didn't. And that there was this entire other story that about this extraordinary woman that sort of fueled or helped fuel a lot of his success and I just couldn't believe I didn't know anything about it. And so I chased it hard and I managed to get the part and then the second that I got the part, the sort of brutal reality of actually having to then play the part kicked in. Would you say there's a time in your career where you felt a turning point, you felt like you could be someone who really does something important and great in this business? A, a gentleman called Michael Grandage, who's a theatre director in England, he had been sent a script by John Logan, who wrote Gladiator and you know, a really formidable screenwriter. A, a theatre script he had been sent, and it was about Mark Rothko and his assistant, and it was called Red. And I basically st studied history of art at university. It was everything I was interested in. And so Michael just sort of slipped this brown paper um, sort of envelope across and said, I've got something that I hope might interest you. And I said, oh, interesting already dreaming of working with this man, went home, sort of started reading it, started reading it, started reading it, completely obsessed. And, and I was lucky enough with Alfred Molina to do a play that reignited my imagination, telling stories that you care about. And I saw Alfred Molina the other day, and uh, he has remained a great friend. And th there's a moment at the end of that play, and my character has been fired, is brutally angry, and, but then turns and thanks him. And I'd done this show for maybe, I mean, we'd done it for months and months and months, and I'd never quite got the word thank you right. And of course, on the last night of doing it on Broadway, I just thanked Fred. And it was so weird that in the one, just the simplicity of just thanking the man rather than thanking, you know, basically schmacting my way through it, you could feel the entire audience lean in. And that, that feeling of people, you know, the human capacity to really hear and feel authenticity, maybe go, oh, no, you can, you can have moments of something that's special. Well, when you look at the stuff that you've done since Red, if it's My Week with Marilyn or Les Miserables or now The Theory of Everything, mm -hmm. have you spoken to Michael Grandage about this work and this renaissance that you feel you've had? Is he proud of you? Oh, gosh. Well, what was lovely, actually, is Michael ended up weirdly in relation to The Theory of Everything. You know, Felicity Jones, who I play opposite, she, he was a great supporter of her early on and of me. And, um, and we knew each other through Michael, as it were, through our friendship at the, at the Don Mar. And, and so inadvertently, the closeness of that, of Felicity and I, meant that jumping into this, which was a film about great intimacy and trust, um, was that much easier. What I'd like to do is play one of my favorite scenes from your new movie, The Theory of Everything. Right. And we're going to pause it cool. at opportune moments and really dissect all the great work that you do. This is a scene early on in the love affair between your character, Stephen Hawking, and Felicity Jones's character, Jane, who becomes your wife. Right. And you're at an absolutely gorgeous party. <laughs> you see how the men's shirt fronts and the bow ties, how they glow more than the women's dresses? Yes. Do you know why? Why? Tied. See, already you're seeing the special connection between the two of them. Mm. They really do seem very enthralled by mm. each other, right? Mm. I mean, what was, what, for, for me, what's specifically intriguing about this film is, is the sort of truth of it. It's something that both Jane and, and Stephen write about, that this first May Ball was a big, incredibly, it was one of the most romantic moments that Jane talks about. And he did indeed start talking about, um, you know, fluorescence. And, uh, and it was under this circumstance with the UV light. Um, and she found it kind of wonderful. I think, the, for me, the idea, I find it so attractive when people are passionate, whatever they're passionate about. Um, mm. and, and in this moment, he, he talks entirely, truly about what he's interested in. And, and you can see her connection to that. But interestingly, just watching there, how I hold the, um, the champagne glass, 
was interesting because what's difficult for people diagnosing and studying ALS is to know where it starts. Mm. So what was important for me was that at the top of the film, he probably already has ALS. That's an early clue. And how it's manifested in him physically. So things like how he holds the glass and th those were little choices I was trying to make, but, um, but that was interesting seeing that. I like that. The washing powder. The fluorescence in the washing powder is caught by the UV light. Why do you know that? <laughs> okay, I love, I love his smile here. And it's not exactly your smile, it's yeah. Stephen's smile. And his face is so expressive, and obviously that's something you needed to really rely mm. on in the later parts of the film when you are wheelchair bound. Mm. But that must have been something you worked on a lot, was yeah. the face. And the face, you're, you know, you're absolutely right. When you meet Stephen now, even though he can move very few muscles, it is one of, well, he has one of the most expressive, if not the most expressive face I've ever met. Um, Jane and his mum, Stephen's mum, talked about how he had incredibly expressive eyebrows as well and that that served him well as the disease to, um, took hold. And so I, I wish I could say there was a more elegant way uh, than sitting in front of the mirror with an iPad and all the documentary material that I could find and sort of trying to recreate. And there were some incredibly embarrassing moments that were anyone to have witnessed would have been uh, pretty horrific. Well, there's more scientific flirtation coming up here. <laughs> when stars are born and when, when they die, they emit UV radiation. So if we could see the night sky in the ultraviolet light, then almost all the stars would disappear, and all that we would see are these spectacular births and deaths. So when you're watching this, is he nervous talking to her because he's got this crush on her, or is he completely at ease because he feels so connected to her, or is it a mixture of the two? I think there was always, he always had a confidence, Stephen, and I think he was quite player. You look at some of the photos of him then, and with the Buddy Holly glasses, and <laughs> I think there was definitely a confidence there, and I, and I sure. always loved that he was passionate enough about what he was interested in to believe that other people would be passionate enough about it. So I think there's a kind of confidence here. All I can look at is the, the UV lighting and remembering that I'm so freckled that when you put me in UV light, I mean, I look like something out of a horror show. So <laughs> I, I think they'd written this scene and thinking, God, what a beautiful visual effect we're going to have. And I was like saying to Benoit, the DP, I was like, uh, you should probably test what I look yeah. like in, in, in UV light. All right, here's the end of the scene. I reckon it would look a little... Like that. When you think about the obvious challenges that presented themselves for the second half of the film, where of course Stephen is wheelchair bound and you're really limited as far as what you can do physically, how did that compare to the challenges at the beginning of the film in the performance when he was able-bodied? The, the real truth was that James Marsh, the director, allowed me the time on this film and that's something you so rarely get on film and I had four months mm -hmm. to work by myself and with collaborators to really work on the physical element because when you meet Stephen his disease is entirely secondary he couldn't be less interested it's he was diagnosed with it at age 21 and he has not let it stand in his way he's someone that looks forward and s similarly with the process of this when I was trying to come up with a process I thought I've I've got to be able to make the physical element so embedded mm. that when it comes to actually playing, it's the human story that, that matters. And, and really, James's gift in that was, was time, because the other thing you don't have when you're filming nowadays, generally, is the time right. to, you, you have to shoot out of chronology. Sure. And so what was important was to have spent all that time working beforehand so that I could just slip in a day between different physicalities and let that not distract from the kind of emotional side of it. It's such a magical scene, so thanks so much for taking us through it. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thanks so much for watching Fandango Frontrunners. So, you get a parting gift. Do I? Before you leave. That's amazing. This is your own custom-made... Are you kidding? Uh, Fandango gift card. That's the greatest present I've ever got. <laughs> amazing. So, I'm gonna take a photo. Yeah, so we look here. So here, I'm gonna go like this. Three, two. Yes! All right, All right thank God. Mate, what? This is wonderful, guys. Isn't that thank great? you so much.